It's a showdown that's been brewing for years, and 2022 is increasingly looking like the year that the war everyone has feared will finally happen, the United States versus Iran. How do the two sides stack up to each other, and how would a war between the two play out? Iran is ranked in 14th place amongst the world's top militaries, not bad for a nation that's been under severe sanctions for years, but today it's facing off against the world's number one ranked military and only global superpower, the United States of America. A conflict between Iran and the US is unlikely to become severe enough to cause a need for the US to fully mobilize its population, though Iran might certainly need to. However, more population means a bigger economy and more capabilities, and here the United States takes the cake, with a population of 335 million versus Iran's 86 million. That's a difference of 249 million more Americans than Iranians. Of that population, though, the US could call on 147 million for a potential military service, though only 122 million of them are physically or mentally fit enough to actually serve. Iran, on the other hand, has a manpower pool of 48 million, with only 40 million actually fit for service. If a war between Iran and the US were to turn into a multi-year stalemate, it would be important to quickly replenish losses. And here too, the United States holds the advantage, with 4.3 million teenagers reaching military age annually, versus Iran's 1.3 million. Currently, though, on active duty, the United States has the world's third largest military, with a 1.39 million strong military versus Iran's 575,000. Reserves are important for replenishing casualties and rotating out exhausted troops to give them a chance to recoup and recover, and both countries are pretty evenly matched there, with the US having a reservist force of 442,000 versus Iran's 350,000. Iran enjoys such large amounts of reservists thanks to the fact that its military service is compulsory for all males upon reaching adulthood. This means that the Iran the Iranian active duty military is largely made up of conscripts, with few professional volunteer soldiers. These conscripts are typically drafted at age 19 and made to serve two years, though few receive much useful military training during that time. Most Iranian soldiers rarely ever fire their weapons and have to work with equipment that's mostly from the first half of the Cold War. This is in sharp contrast with the US military, which maintains an aggressive year-round training cycle. Training is frequently punctuated with small-scale exercises and occasionally with larger multi-unit exercises. The US Navy's RIMPAC exercise, for example, is a massive event that takes place every two years and involves the military forces of over two dozen partner nations across the Pacific Rim. Not only do conscripts traditionally perform very poorly against professional all-volunteer forces, but Iran's conscripts undergo very little useful training and would be completely overwhelmed against America's professionally trained warfighters. A military is only as good as the equipment it can afford, and war is a costly affair. Iran has an annual budget of $5 billion for its military, though the nation spends significant amounts of money under the table carrying out various military-related activities in its sphere of influence. By comparison, the United States has a defense budget of $770 billion, absolutely dwarfing what Iran spends annually. In the realm of military hardware, Iran fields an air force of 543 planes versus the US's 13,247. Of these, on Iran's side, 197 are fighter aircraft, while the US maintains a fighter fleet of 1,957. If Iran and the US were to come to blows, the US might find itself surprised to be taking on one of its own most capable fighters ever built during the Cold War. That's because Iran is still fielding the F-14 Tomcat, having an estimated 40 of them still in service. This is thanks to a pre-revolution deal with the Iranian government that saw them buy 80 of the planes, though only 79 were delivered. After the revolution, the United States shut down all support for Iran's Tomcat fleet, and it feared having to go up against the formidable fighter so much that it actually destroyed every single Tomcat it retired to prevent Iran from having any opportunity of seizing badly needed parts for maintenance. Without US support for parts replacement, its Tomcat fleet has been steadily shrinking as planes are cannibalized to keep others flying. Today it's believed between 40 to 43 of them are still mission capable, with 20 fully mission capable and 20 only partially mission capable. The rest of Iran's air fleet is made up of Cold War era MiG-29s, American F-4 Phantom IIs and F-5 Tiger II, Chinese J-7s, Mirage F-1s, Su-22s and domestically made at HESA Kosar and HESA Saike. The latter are only available in very low numbers and are both light attack jets, widely considered to be very inefficient machines. In a ground attack role, Iran is forced to use multi-role planes such as the Su-22 and domestically modified F-5E, known as the HESA Azarash. Both planes are only suited for small-scale strike missions and with a lack of targeting pods are incapable of precision strikes. Iran's fighter fleet is largely non-modern, though some of their planes have received fourth-generation avionics. However, so many different aircraft models are a nightmare to conduct maintenance on, so it's unlikely many of these planes are actually operationally ready, and even less likely they would remain 
remain so during high-tempo combat operations. Such a diverse and mixed air fleet drives up both maintenance costs and time, and can make sourcing replacement parts a nightmare. By comparison, though, the United States fields the world's most modern air fleet, though some of the planes are showing a growing lack of modernity. The F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon are both extremely capable fighter aircraft, capable of both air superiority and ground attack, but are showing their age against increasingly sophisticated modern fighters and air defenses. America's F-22 remains the single deadliest airplane in the sky, with significant capability overmatch against any other fighter aircraft in the world. However, it's also one of the most expensive aircraft in the world, forcing the US Air Force to limit its production run to just under 200. Today, 195 remain in service, and no further Raptors will ever be built. Instead, the US Air Force is already looking ahead to a sixth-generation fighter for air superiority with a prototype already tested and flown. In the meantime, it relies on its fleet of F-15s and F-35s for the air superiority mission, with 283 fifth-generation F-35s across all arms of the US military. This number grows every year, with a planned purchase of 1,763 F-35s for just the US Air Force alone. Lockheed Martin is set to provide the US military with approximately 135 planes per year until the contract is completed, making US Air Forces deadlier with every passing year. The US Navy and Marines, meanwhile, operate the vaunted F-18 Super Hornet, which replaced the F-14 Tomcat in 1985. One of the most agile jets on the planet, it's light enough to be launched from carriers but capable of bringing large weapons packages to the fight, making it perfect as a multi-role fighter. To support ground troops, though, the US Air Force relies on the A-10 Thunderbolt II, an impressive ground attack aircraft that has achieved legendary status since its introduction in 1977. Strategic bombing is carried out by a mixed fleet of B-52 Stratofortresses, B-2 Spirits, and B-1B Lancers. The B-52 was put into service first in 1955 and incredibly is set to remain in service until the 2050s, making it the longest service aircraft in history. Thanks to aggressive upgrades, the plane remains one of the deadliest bombers in the sky and proved itself against the Soviet defenses during the Vietnam War thanks to its aggressive suite of electronic warfare countermeasures. The American B-2 fleet was originally designed to slip behind enemy lines and deliver strategic nuclear strikes and remains the world's only stealth bomber. An upgrade after the fall of the Soviet Union saw it geared for more conventional combat and now is tasked with slipping through the densest enemy air defenses and eliminating high-value targets. The B-1B Lancer is a much faster strategic bomber that has less endurance than the B-52 but can fly at supersonic speeds to deliver bombs quickly where they're needed the most. America's overwhelming advantage in attack aircraft places Iranian ground forces at serious risk. Unlike powers like China and Russia, US aircraft are largely multi-role capable and its pilots trained in both air superiority and ground attack missions. This gives the United States a significant advantage over any competitor, and an edge that only makes a war an increasingly bad proposition for Iran. To fend off the mighty US Air Force, Iran relies not on air superiority fighters, but on a robust layer of ground-based air defenses. At the outermost layer are Iran's longest range air defenses, the Bavar 373, which is a reverse-engineered Russian S-300. It also has a few S-300 batteries courtesy of Russia who delivered them in 2015 after Iran joined the JCPOA nuclear deal. With a range of 155 miles, these present a significant threat to fourth-generation aircraft, but F-35s equipped with glide bombs or even B-52s using standoff attack munitions could easily overwhelm and destroy these batteries on their radar. At intermediate range, Iran fields an update on a reverse-engineered American SM-1 missile sold to the Iranian Navy prior to the revolution. The 1960s tech has been updated with domestic upgrades, producing the Sayyad 2, which boasts a range of 46 miles, though the longer Sayyad 3 has a range of 75 miles. These missiles can be difficult to destroy on the ground because they can be mounted on very agile truck-mounted launchers, which can rapidly reposition. For short to intermediate range engagements, Iran has the Salimcha missiles, produced from reverse-engineered American Hawk missiles provided to Iran in the 1960s. Iran also has a new triple rail launcher system called Mersad and has the ability to engage up to two targets simultaneously. Various other foreign source SAM systems have been cloned or reverse engineered by Iran, and the nation fields a sizable quantity of low altitude defense systems meant to be used against helicopters. However dense Iranian air defenses are, most of them are static and well known to the US. By using a combination of stealth aircraft, standoff attack munitions, and electronic jamming, the US with its overwhelming air fleet could easily dismantle the Iranian air defense system, just like the US did with zero or minimal losses in Iraq, Libya, and Syria. To support its ground forces, Iran has nothing more than a token attack helicopter fleet, which would not survive initial contact against US forces equipped with short-range air defenses and man pads. The US, on the other hand, has the world's 
largest attack helicopter fleet, made up of 910 helicopters, including the Apache and Super Cobra, used by the American Marine Corps. These attack helicopters are both heavily armored and can provide flexible close air support, as well as engage in reconnaissance and hunter-killer missions. The Apache in particular is an incredibly robust aircraft, with only a single Apache lost to heavy anti-aircraft fire during an ambush by Iraq's military at Najaf. However, the 32 Apaches were forced to retreat and unable to carry out their deep attack mission behind enemy lines, which is their primary purpose. This has prompted the need by the US Army to replace its aging Apaches with more capable variants who can survive modern combat. In a conflict between Iran and the US, tanks will largely be the dominant weapon of choice thanks to a largely flat, open terrain of the country. Iran brings 2,831 tanks to fight, while the United States has the world's second largest fleet at 6,612. Iran's tanks, however, are mostly Cold War relics, though it does field capable T-72s upgraded with modern armor, sensor, and cannons. However, Iran's tanks are largely considered to be inferior to any Western model, let alone the vaunted American Abrams. An effort to build a next-generation domestic tank failed in the late 2010s and was likely just a big publicity ploy to get Russia to lower its asking price for supplying the country with tanks. The Zulfikar series of domestically made tanks suffer from weapons embargoes, leaving Iran incapable of equipping them with truly modern systems. The United States' own Abrams have been continuously upgraded since their introduction to the US armed forces. Currently, the Abrams tank fleet is being upgraded to System Enhancement Program version 4, which finally brings a third-generation thermal imager to the Abrams tank, a key weakness plaguing American tanks for years. Trophy anti-missile defense systems have also started to be integrated into American tanks, using radar and explosive charges to defeat enemy anti-tank missiles. To see why this has become so critically important, one only need to look at the performance of Russian armor in Ukraine today, with Ukraine forces killing hundreds of modern Russian tanks with anti-tank missiles. With each upgrade, though, the Abrams tank is becoming heavier and heavier, a serious problem for the tank fleet as it's now feared the tank might be too heavy to cross some bridges. Greater weight also means more fuel expenditure, lowering its already short combat range between 93 and 124 miles in cross-country conditions. However, American Abrams would prove absolutely lethal to Iran's own tank fleets, and their improved protection against RPGs and IEDs means that they'll even be more survivable in urban environments, where most of the fighting will likely end up taking place. Armored personnel carriers are important for helping support one's infantry and protecting them in a deadly modern battlefield. The United States can boast total mechanized capabilities for its infantry, while Iran struggles to do the same. The US fields a fleet of over 45,000 armored vehicles versus Iran's 7,600. Again, Iran's armored vehicles are early Russian or late Soviet models and severely lacking in modernity upgrades thanks to budget limitations and sanctions. American Bradleys, meanwhile, are capable of engaging other lightly armored vehicles and even taking out tanks thanks to two anti-tank missiles on each vehicle. Both Iran and the US have comparable amounts of artillery, with the US fielding 1,498 self-propelled artillery and 1,339 towed artillery such as howitzers. Iran, meanwhile, has 1,030 self-propelled artillery and 2,108 towed artillery pieces. The similarity in capabilities here is because the United States traditionally relies on much more flexible and accurate air assets for fire support, even though its artillery corps are significantly more capable than Iran's own thanks to the use of smart munitions. New guided projectiles have actually earned American artillery a world record for distance, firing a shell 43 miles and hitting a practice target with pinpoint accuracy. However, even Iran's dumb artillery is a significant threat to both vehicles and personnel, and the large numbers of artillery available to Iran should not be ignored in a potential conflict scenario. Of course, thanks to air dominance, Iranian artillery batteries would be decidedly non-survivable assets in combat. Multiple rocket projectors or rocket artillery can be devastating when used against infantry. By firing significant numbers of rockets in short succession, MLRS rocket systems deny infantry a chance to get to cover the way tube artillery and its far slower rate of fire does. The US employs 1,366 MLRS, while Iran has 2,485, again mostly Russian or Soviet-made. For all the incompetence of Russia's modern military forces, the Ukrainian conflict shows that even basic MLRS systems are devastating when used in large numbers. This too is a threat that shouldn't be discarded, but unlikely to be very survivable against the US's air fleets. Naval operations will be an important part of a war between Iran and the US. At sea, the US fields navy made up of 484 vessels versus Iran's 142. However, most of Iran's navy is made up of smaller patrol boats. The US meanwhile operates 11 supercarriers, each carrying four squadrons of attack aircraft and various special mission aircraft such as tankers, electronic warfare platforms, and airborne radar. The US also has a fleet of nine smaller carriers meant to support amphibious operations, equipped with helicopters and the US Marines variant of the F-35 capable of vertical landing. 
Under the waves, the U.S. has a fleet of 68 submarines, with the new Virginia-class submarines replacing Cold War-era Los Angeles-class subs. American submarines aren't just deadly to Iran's navy, but can even use cruise missiles to attack land targets deep inside Iranian territory. Long holding the advantage in underwater tech, American subs are notoriously stealthy and difficult to track. Iran, meanwhile, has a fleet of 19 subs, though most of these are midget submarines. These small submarines are primarily meant to attack shipping inside the Persian Gulf and Gulf of Oman, with Iran's stated goal of being to block traffic of large oil-laden ships in case of war with the U.S. This would have a devastating effect on global gas prices, and it's the U.S.'s top priority to locate and destroy these tiny submarines before they can succeed in their mission. The rest of the Iranian submarine fleet consists of three Soviet-era Kilo-class and one Iranian Fateh-class submarine though the latter is not well suited for deep water operations. Again, largely lacking in modernity, the fact that these are diesel electric submarines means there could still be a significant threat to unwary U.S. assets. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. Navy allowed its once prolific anti-submarine warfare capabilities to seriously atrophy, leading to a series of embarrassing exercises with friendly nation submarines in the early 2000s. However, since then, any hostilities seem more likely with China, and the U.S. has beefed up its ASW capabilities once more, even adopting fleets of drones to aid in the task of hunting down and tracking enemy subs. Killing a major American ship with an older and less technologically advanced sub is not impossible for Iran, but very difficult and extremely unlikely to happen more than once. Iran's surface fleet has only about nine major combatants in the form of corvettes and frigates, the rest being fast attack boats and patrol boats. Iran's surface combatants would face 92 American destroyers and 22 corvettes, though likely it would be carrier-based aircraft who would destroy Iran's surface fleet before it can take much action against American ships. However, smaller patrol and torpedo boats could prove more difficult to target, and if employed in swarm tactics, could end up at least causing significant damage to large U.S. ships. The advantage is clearly on the U.S. side in almost every single category, with U.S. forces fielding far more capable equipment and having better trained troops. So, how would a war with Iran play out? A real war would be unlikely to include ground forces, as the U.S. would be very reluctant to get dragged into yet a third ground war in the Middle East. However, if removal of the regime was necessary for some reason, the U.S. would have to commit ground forces in the effort. First, American carrier-based aircraft supported by the Air Force strike aircraft flying from nearby friendly airfields in Saudi Arabia would launch a massive air assault against the nation. No doubt, Iran would immediately or even preemptively launch a large ballistic missile attack against these airfields and even U.S. vessels, but thanks to robust air defenses and the assistance of Saudi defenses, few of these missiles would cause significant damage. Iran has proven in multiple missile attacks against Israeli targets that its targeting capabilities are spotty at best, further reducing the threat posed by ballistic missiles. American Wild Weasel aircraft would first engage enemy air defenses, destroying either missile platforms themselves or their supporting radar. More mobile, shorter-range air defenses might threaten some U.S. aircraft, but it's unlikely that Iran would down a significant amount of U.S. planes. Traditionally, the U.S. is extremely good at neutral neutralizing air defense networks, and while some air defenses may be mobile, their radars rarely ever are. Without radar, most air defense assets are practically useless. Iran could rely on actual anti-air artillery left over from the Cold War, but with U.S. planes flying so high, this is unlikely to achieve any results. Next, American planes would pummel missile sites, command and control nodes, logistics hubs, and even troop barracks, bringing devastation across the country from the air. Strikes would also take place against port facilities and major surface warships, while under the waves, U.S. attack submarines and cooperation with ASW aircraft work to pinpoint Iran's submarine fleet and neutralize it. However, even an overwhelming aerial campaign would be insufficient to bring Iran to heel. For that, the Americans would have to commit to a ground war. Invading through Iraq would be difficult, as it would mean passing through thick swamps that favor the defender and then running straight into the Zagros Mountains. Going in through Turkey would be incredibly unlikely. Turkey did not allow the U.S. to use it as a staging base for Iraq's invasion, and relations between the U.S. and Turkey have significantly soured since then. Going through Afghanistan in the east would mean traversing two deserts, which would put U.S. forces far from any strategically important targets. It's likely then that an amphibious assault would be necessary, and while the U.S. Navy and Marines are up to the task, amphibious assaults can be costly, dangerous affairs. However, once in-country with a beachhead established, even with superior capabilities, actually defeating Iran would be difficult for the U.S. That's thanks to the sheer size of the country, which is larger than several European countries combined. A study in the late 2000s showed that the U.S. would need about 1.6 million troops to successfully occupy the entire country, meaning the U.S. would either have to initiate conscription or draw in partners for the invasion, something it might actually be able to do given tensions in the Middle East between Iran and many of its neighbors. If the invasion was reasonable
reasonably justified, the US could likely count on international support anyway. In all likelihood, Iran would try to make the US bleed as much as possible with its conventional forces, but seek to defeat it through asymmetrical means like those employed in Afghanistan. Intelligence shows that today Iran is attempting to infiltrate a network of agents into the US to target political figures such as former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who is now under guard 24-7. By turning to terrorist group allies, Iran could turn America's invasion into a second Afghanistan, and the US public has little stomach for yet another two-decade war. However, the US might be able to count on the Iranian people themselves to help them overthrow the current regime, especially if it keeps civilian casualties to a minimum. Many people in Iran are tired of living under sanctions and under the thumb of an oppressive Tehran regime, and it's likely that the US would be welcomed as liberators across much of Iran. In this regard, Iran is different from either Iraq or Afghanistan, and a lack of popular support could hinder Iran's ability to launch a successful asymmetrical campaign against US forces. Now go check out Iran versus Saudi Arabia. Who would win? Or click this other video instead.